Good morning and welcome to the Library of Virginia's presentation, Virginia and the Southeast in 17th Century Maps. Yes, that includes Maryland too. My name is Cassandra Farrell. I am the Senior Map Archivist at the Library of Virginia. And this presentation was originally given on October 22nd as part of the library's annual Natalie M. And excuse me, the Allen M. and Natalie P. Voorhees Lecture on the History of Cartography. We are using closed captioning. I will do my very best to ensure that words are pronounced correctly. However, there may be some hiccups as the closed captioning may not correctly spell words that I pronounce during this presentation. So let's get started. Today's presentation is in regards to, see if I can get to the screen here. Looks like it's freezing up. Hmm. Okay. So. Okay, let's try this again. The two maps that you see in front of you, the Theodore Debris and John White map of Virginia and North Carolina titled America Pars Nunc Virginia Dicta. That's on my left hand side. And the map that's on my right hand side, the Florida America Provincia by Jack Wes Lemoyne and Theodore Debris were two maps that were basically composites of commercial maps of Virginia and the Southeast in the early 17th century, meaning many map publishers and map engravers use these two maps as their, their sources, uh, their muse, for, uh, for lack of a better word, in their portrayal and also their descriptions of what we now call the American Southeast. Both were originally manuscript maps. The manuscript map by John White is still extant. It resides at the British Museum, whereas the Jack Les Lemoyne manuscript map of Florida is no longer extant as far as we know. In both instances, the famous publisher Theodore Debris acquired copies of the manuscripts, engraved them, printed them, and published both of them in his multi-volume series known as the America series, which was a very, very popular series about the new world and the explorations and discoveries of the new world. But the maps that you see in front of you right now are the engraved copies. Uh, the Theodore White debris copy uh, clearly indicates English control of North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, you have coats of arms presence. You have um, ships sailing in the seas. There's a more effect has been used to display the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, there are hints that there's a number of trees that can be used for shipbuilding and other industries. And the title is an elaborate cartouche. You see the same effect on the Lemoyne map of Florida that was engraved by Theodore Debris. Although it doesn't scream English power and control, it does indicate the French presence in Florida in South Carolina. Again, he used a, a silk more effect 
to identify and show the Atlantic Ocean. Um, ships, of course, are sailing the seas. Both maps show sea monsters. And if you look closely at the Theodore debris John White map, you'll notice that there are indigenous peoples represented along the Outer Bank Coast. They're, they're really nifty maps. Now, let's take a look at the John White published map in comparison with the manuscript map currently at the British Museum. The manuscript copy, which is on my right hand side, it is clearly, clearly a manuscript map. And it's also been described as an encyclopedic source, meaning that John White did not intend to indicate British power and authority. He created the map for information purposes. He's identifying the sea creatures present in the area. He's indicating the coastline. And for all intents and purposes, most likely this was designed to help captains and other sailors as they navigated the Southeast coast. The Raleigh coat of arms and the British coat of arms are present. And of course there is a lovely colored compass rose. And of course, there are names present along the coastline. If you look at the white version published by Theodore Debris, you get a very different experience. Uh, you have the British coat of arms, you have Virginia in very large lettering, lettering that dominates the names of indigenous tribes in the region, thus indicating British power and British control over the area. What's also really cool are the Mariner dividers that act as, that, that are part of the uh, scale. Now, who are these people? Who was Jacques Les Lemoyne? Um, Jacques Les Lemoyne uh, was a French artist who worked with Jean Rivaud's expedition to the New World, 1564 to 1565. He uh, was the, the artist basically hired to record the expedition. And as part of that, he also served as the expedition's cartographer. So he is painting landscapes. He's drawing reliefs of the land. And he's also recording those indigenous tribes that the French meet and uh, negotiate with, if negotiate is the right word, but with whom they come into contact. He did return to France. Uh, the voyage back was very interesting to say the least, but he did make it back to France. He eventually was forced to move to England he was a Protestant, and after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, he, um, he had to leave France. He moved to England, where he became a well-known botanical artist, and his patrons included Sir Walter Raleigh and Larry, Lady Mary Sidney. And at some point, we think after his death, his widow, sold his drawings to Theodore Debris. Well, we are all familiar with John White, um, mainly because his granddaughter was the first documented English person born in North America. He was born in the English Midlands or Cornwall. He was married. There is indication that he did study art, uh, in fact, he seems to have been familiar with miniature portraiture, uh, as indicated in the, his illustrations of American Indians. The different poses that they're in indicate that um, he was influenced by the work of Nicholas Hilliard, who was Queen Elizabeth's favorite limner. But it's very possible that John White participated in Martin Frobisher's many expeditions to Greenland. Um, 
Frobisher, like uh, many explorers, hired artists to document their voyages, their explorations, their findings. So it wasn't, um, when you think about it, it's, it's not unusual that someone like John White was a part of the Roanoke voyages to Virginia and North Carolina in the mid 1580s. The question is, did he and Thomas Harriet travel to the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, we are, we don't know. That is unclear at this time. Perhaps historians will find documentation at some point indicating that he and Thomas Harriet did go to the Chesapeake Bay, but at this point, um, scholars say that they most likely did not travel to the Chesapeake Bay area when they were in living in the Outer Banks in the mid 1580s. Well, Theodore de Brie uh, was a Flemish German engraver and publisher, um, Protestant. He operated his business in Strasbourg and Frankfurt. He uh, was a colleague of Richard Hackloop. And he, as we've, I've stated before, he was responsible for engraving um, John White's manuscript map and Jacques Lemoyne's manuscript map. He is also responsible for engraving the images for Thomas Harriet's A Brief and True Report of the Newfoundland of Virginia. Uh, during the Roanoke voyages, John White was the artist, but Thomas Harriet was the scientist, and the two did work together. So in the 17th century, in the first half of the 17th century in particular, the White and Lemoyne maps were, um, they were highly influential. And map makers who engraved maps of the Southeast, that included Virginia, relied on their work. So let's take a look at a few of those early 17th century maps. And we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at the map makers first so that you know who they are <laughs> and when we mention their names or when I mention their names during this presentation and we take a look at their maps you know exactly who I will be talking about and they are interesting people excuse me while I take a drink of coffee William Blau a well-known Dutch a map maker. He lived in the Netherlands and ironically he began his career working as a clerk for a herring dealer. He left that job and he studied under Tycho Brahe. Many of you who are interested in the history of science know who Tycho Brahe is and while he was with Tycho Brahe he studied astronomy, land surveying and mathematics. He married, he moved to Amsterdam and it's in Amsterdam in the late 16th century that he becomes a commercial globe, an instrument maker and a cartographer. He published a celestial globe in 1599 that showed Tycho Brahe's catalog of 1,000 stars. Why is this a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because it's the first non-Ptolemaic representation of the heavens. And of course, Ptolemy um, originally um, drafted his maps uh, while Rome still ruled the earth and that should give you an idea of how long his uh, how long his work influenced Europeans. William Blau is well known um, for his pilot guides that he published. He drew these, and his pilot guides were very very helpful to mariners as they traveled the European sea coast, the Mediterranean. He didn't start to publish individual maps until 1605, and he did that because he needed the money, and any maps that he published were maps that would sell. He was not interested in publishing maps and drafting and engraving maps because he loved them. He, he may have loved them. I can't say he didn't. 
but he was certainly interested in ensuring that whatever ones that they sold were indeed going to sell because they need to be able to recoup the money used to purchase the copper plates and to have those engraved. He was not an engraver, so he is not one of the men or women working in the shops engraving copper plates. Instead, he hired a number of well-known engravers and he uh, was known for accepting the geographical designs um, from other artists. Ironically, he did not publish his first world atlas until 1630. And at the end of his career, he was appointed hydrographer for East, the East India Company, which is very important to know because it means he had access to up-to-date information. He had access to real-time information, which meant that he could produce maps that reflected current cartographic information, bathymetric information, topographic information, and of course, could include up-to-date toponymy as well. So he uh, is a highly regarded Dutch map maker from the early part of the 17th century. And he was in competition with the Hondius firm. Jodicus Hondius Sr. lived in Amsterdam as well. He was a cartographer. And he purchased Gerard Mercator's copper place in 1604. Yes, this is the Gerard Mercator who, who came up with Mercator's projection. In 1606, he sold an updated edition of Mercator's Atlas that included plates or maps of Spain and of the New World, including one titled Virginia Item at Florida. He was married to Coletta Van Den Keer. She was a sister of a well-known engraver, Petrus K. Arias, and I, I'm sure I did not say his last name correctly, but you will see his name on a number of maps published in the 17th century. When Jodicus Hondius Sr. died unexpectedly in 1612, it was his widow, Coletta, who continued the family business, and her sons, Jodicus and Henricus, collaborated with her. So Jodicus Hondius Sr. dies in 1612. Coletta, his wife, continues the family business with the help of her two sons, Jodicus Hondius Jr. and Henricus Hondius. Jodicus Hondius Jr. began engraving his own maps um, around the time of his father's death. He opened up his own shop and was actually putting together a world atlas when he died unexpectedly in 1629. And during his life, he uh, was known for publishing maps and globes. And Upon his death, his widow sold his plates for his atlas, the atlas he had been working on, to his competitor, William Lau. That's important to remember. His widow sold the plates that he had been working on to his competitor, William Lau. This did not go over well with his brother, Henricus Hondius, who was also a map publisher and map engraver. Henricus continued to work with his mother. He partnered with his brother-in-law, Joannes Jansonius. And when his brother's work was sold to his competitor, William Blau, he and Jansonius, his brother-in-law, decided to publish an atlas to compete with Blau's atlas. So basically, they were forced to update the Mercator atlas, meaning that they had to engraved new copper plates for this, for a new world atlas. Johannes Jansonius, uh, brother-in-law to Henricus Hondius and partner, is also a well-regarded map maker and engraver and is known for publishing a sea atlas in the 1650s. And what's important about this is it was the first sea atlas published that encompassed the entire world and not just the European coastline which means that the Blau firm 
has significant competition in the pilot guide business. The, the, the Hondius firm is publishing sea atlases in the 1650s. The Blau firm has got to keep up. So let's take a look at this map, Virginia, Idom, F, Florida, which was uh, drawn by Jodicus Hondius, originally published by Jodicus Hondius Sr. in the updated Girardi Mercator Atlas in 1606. This particular copy was included in the 1628 publication of the Atlas published by Henricus Hondius, but it comes from that plate, the same plate that was engraved for the 1606 Atlas. And this is indeed a composite of the Jacques Lemoyne and John White maps. The Jacques Lemoyne influence can be seen from St. Augustine all the way up to C.S. Romano, the toponymy C.S. Romano. Information from C.S. Romano further north are based on John White's map of Virginia and North Carolina. He, as usual, includes sea monsters. You can't have a good 17th century map without a sea monster present in the seas. And there are indigenous people sailing off the coast of South Carolina. Their canoes are dug out, replicating those identified and drawn by European artists who had been to the New World. He, of course, shows a great lake up here. And then here are notations beside the mountains and a waterfall indicating that there are silver mines and gold mines nearby. Of course, you also must show that there are um, wildlife present, including a standing turkey. And Hondius included Native Americans from Lemoyne's drawings. Uh, these are um, very, very, would have been very familiar to readers of Debris' America series. And as you look at the title, which is in an elaborate cartouche, indigenous villages are, are positioned on either side of the atlas. This one is representative of indigenous villages in Virginia, North Carolina. Whereas this picture is indicative of those that were found in Florida and in South Carolina. And as you move over to the Carolina coastline, indeed, all you need to do is compare it with John White's map, and it's very clear um, who was in use for this. Now, this map was also completed by Jodicus Hondius, and it was included in a smaller atlas titled Atlas Minor. Jodicus Hondius Sr. was concerned about the size of the original Girardi uh, Mercator Atlas. He was concerned that um, it was difficult to, to use, it was expensive, and perhaps a smaller atlas that would be easier to carry around and would be less expensive, perhaps that was needed. So he created a smaller atlas that was not as expensive. And this map indeed um, is a much smaller version of the map we just looked at. And you, you can see that a number of features have been removed. You have a title and a, again, a elaborate cartouche, but there are no indigenous Indian villages on either side of it. The Indian figures that were present here or have been removed. I do not see any sea monsters, uh, but the information is still based on the Jack Wes Lemoyne and John White maps. This was published in a French edition, a German edition, and a Dutch edition. And Map historians who have had the opportunity to really compare this map with the larger Virginia item at Florida map by Jodicus Hondia Sr. Um, indicate that the information removed from this map um, 
perhaps some of it should have remained because the larger map is indeed the better map. So here is the competitor's version of the of the American Southeast. Lao had this map engraved, and this particular copy is State Two, and it was published by his son in an atlas sometime between 1648 and 1658. Well, what's interesting about this map is, is the marked improvements over the Hondia senior copy. In this, with this edition, um, the, the latitude information here is correct. The coastline has been improved significantly. And the information in Virginia comes from John Smith's famous map of Virginia published in 1612. So it does illustrate two um, nations. You have the French coat of arms here. You have the English coat of arms present up here. The information um, in this particular, in this area is from the Le Moyne map. Uh, the area, the information in regards to depicting the uh, outer banks does come from the white map. Um, but what's interesting is, is that the outer banks region um, and the improvements of the South Carolina coast are reflective of the work done by Hessel Garretts in his um, publication, De Islanden. The improvements that you see in these areas are based upon his publications. So the Chesapeake Bay area, of course, based on John Smith's work, um, has been greatly improved. The toponyms that you see, the words that you see, of, are based on Smith's maps. And Newport News is shown for the first time on a map. You have Native American people surrounding the cartouche and the title. Of course, there are no uh, villages represented, but the indigenous Indians present in Hondia Senior's original map of the Southeast and Virginia have been incorporated into um, and made into figures that surround the, the cartouche here. So this map is in two states, um, meaning that there were changes made to the copper plate from the first publication to the second um, state being engraved. And in the first state, this chair does not have a tail. In the second state, the cherub does have a tail, as you can see. What's also interesting about both states of Blau's map of the Southeast is that the longitude degree marks down here are incorrect. They read 298, 299, 200. That's actually important information to know, especially when you compare it to his competitor's version. Jan Jansen, was responsible for engraving and publishing the Hondius firm's answer to Blau's map of Virginia and the Southeast. Their Virginia Partis Australis at Florida is a direct copy of Blau's map. It includes the same information. It includes the same updates. Everything is basically the same except for one unique difference. The longitude degree marks on the Jansonius copy, they're correct. So they read 290, 298, 299, 300. That's how you can tell the difference between the Blau and Jansonius copies. You have to look at the longitude degree marks. And if you're dealing, if you're looking at the first state of a Blau map, you'll know it's not a Jansonius copy because the cherub won't have a tail but that's only for the first state. So let's just do a brief comparison of the area. Here you go. Here is the Blau copy 
298-299-200, on the Jansonius version. Also, when you look at the latitude markings, there they are um, colored in black on the Blau copy, whereas on the Jansonius copy, they are white. So that's another minute difference that you might want to look at if you find yourself looking at this map, but you're not quite sure if it's a Blau or a Jansonius copy. Well, what other mid-century maps were published? Well, as you move into the mid part of the 17th century, you, you still see maps influenced by John White and Jack Wesley Moy. But you begin to see other others uh, publishing maps that include information from Smith's map. And they also begin to incorporate information from reports coming in from Virginia. And so you do see the maps uh, beginning to change. And so in this section, um, we're gonna be looking at maps by Sir Robert Dudley, Robert Fair and Virginia Fair, John Letterer, and Augustine Hermit. So who was Sir Robert Dudley? He was an English sailor, engineer, and explorer. His, he was knighted for his participation in England's naval operations against Spain. He uh, moved to Italy in 1605. He worked for the Grand Duke of Tuscany as an engineer. And in the 1640s, he published a multi-volume work known as Del Arcano. Sir Robert Dudley had a very interesting life. Very interesting. Robert Ferrer and Virginia Ferrer um, lived in England. They, uh, he was an officer of the Virginia Company, so they were very interested in the um, in the Virginia uh, colony. He lived at Little Gidding with his brother who was a priest. And the Fair family was, they were very devout, um, closely followed canonical hours. His daughter probably worked as his um, secretary and she certainly assisted him in map production, particularly the, um, the third, fourth and fifth states of their map of Virginia. So his daughter was well-educated and she worked with members of the Virginia Company and members of the colony of Virginia in conducting experiments to encourage silk production in Virginia. Uh, she conducted a number of experiments that proved beneficial and her findings were relayed to um, the colonists living in Virginia, and they, of course, tried to implement her experiments. John Letterer was a physician who migrated from Hamburg, Germany to Virginia in 1670. He was befriended by Governor Barclay. Yes, it's spelled Berkeley, but his last name is pronounced Barclay. And Barclay apparently thought that he would be the best person to explore Virginia's Piedmont region. So with the support of Governor Barclay, John Letterer embarked upon an exploration of the Piedmont, uh, published a book about it. Due to financial issues, he was forced to move to Maryland and eventually he did return to Germany. And last but not least, the last map maker we'll be looking at today is Augustine Herman. Herman uh, moved to the colony of New York probably in the 1630s. And he had a rich career working as a merchant, as a tobacco trader, as a diplomat, as an explorer, and as a map maker. He moved to Maryland in 1660, and he spent 10 years, 10 years mapping his, or researching for his map of Virginia and Maryland. And he had the support of the colony's governor, Lord Baltimore. 
And historian Christian Coote suspects that it was Lord Baltimore who sponsored Herman's map and its publication in London. And it's also um, important to remember that the king actually granted Herman a copyright for his map. Apparently that was uncommon. Herman remained in Maryland, died in Maryland in the 1680s. Um, his home was along a well-known uh, trading path. He was always thinking about the best way to make money. So let's take a look at Sir Robert Dudley's chart of Virginia and North Carolina. This was engraved by Antonio Francesco Lucini. Apparently, it took Lucini years to engrave this. And he spent a great deal of time ensuring that the coastlines were well they they are deeper they're richer they're darker than the rest of the map because he wanted people to look at the coastline this is a chart so the emphasis is the coast and dudley ensured that shoals were identified and in certain places like the pamlico sound he provided soundings which is very important information for mariners to have this chart was included in the sixth volume of the um, Arcano series. So the, um, the series that Dudley put together um, was about six to eight volumes. And it included information about how to build five classes of naval ships. And the sixth volume included a number of sea charts of which this chart was included. The section about Virginia is from John Smith's map of Virginia, whereas the information regarding the Outer Banks Inc. does indeed come from John White's uh, 1590 map. The names that you see in large font are from Smith's map. And he's clearly creating this map for mariners, those who would be sailing through the Chesapeake Bay region, who would be sailing off the coast of Virginia and North Carolina. You would not be providing soundings and you would not be providing the location of shoals if you did not have these mariners in mind, and he did. The map is important, well, the chart is important because it's the first chart of Virginia, and Mar of Virginia and North Carolina that is based on the Mercator projection, which uh, is a great projection to use for regional maps because it makes it easy for mariners to plot their courses um, from the Chesapeake Bay to a plantation. Because in those days, there was no major um, city center in Virginia so if you were going to be trading, you were trading with the planters themselves and they built wharves, which they and other smaller farmers in the region used to conduct business. So the map language is Italian. Um, there are some Spanish place names in North Carolina. It would be helpful to remember that the prime meridian for this map is the Azores. It's not London, it is the Azores. There are two states. Uh, descriptions for those states are provided on this page. And there are not very many libraries who have cataloged this map. There may be libraries who have copies of the sixth volume of Del Arcano, but you would have to do a search to find out just which institutions carry this volume. So, a map of Virginia, Discover T Hills by John Fair and his daughter Virginia Fair. This was engraved by John Goddard, and it is based upon Sir Robert Dudley's chart of Virginia. It's a very interesting map. It's almost encyclopedic in nature. Uh, it includes um, trees that one could possibly find in Virginia and along the North American coastline. Um, as earlier maps 
have done or showed, you of course have sea creatures off the coast. You have ships sailing off the off the coastline. And not only does it show the Outer Banks region, but it is an attempt to show the coast all the way up to Cape Cod. And so as you can tell, the section regarding Virginia is the most complete and accurate section. Granted, the Chesapeake Bay does take an unusual northeasterly turn, but this, this section is, is definitely um, portrayed much better than uh, New York and New Jersey, Massachusetts, Cape Cod, and Long Island. And you can find Long Island here, and this is the entrance to the Hudson Bay. So you've got a couple of things going on with this map. Um, the Hudson Bay up here meets with the St. Lawrence River to flow into this great sea. Uh, you've got the impression that Jamestown, which is right along here, is not that far away from this great sea. In fact, I'm going to go up another. Here we go. And why is there this impression that there is a great sea just two weeks away from the Virginia coastline, Atlantic coastline? Well, apparently, uh, Edward Bland and Abraham Wood uh, led an exp expedition from Fort Henry to the southwest, and fat, they claim to have found a westerly flowing river. And Governor Barkley had been familiar with American Indian reports about rivers on the other side of the mountains that that flowed into a great sea. And so the Farrer map is famous for portraying that there was a westerly route to the Pacific Ocean and that the Pacific Ocean was just a couple of weeks away from the Atlantic Ocean. And um, this 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 desire to find an all westerly route from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, um, the hopes for this did not really die until the Lewis and Clark expedition of the early 19th century. But so the map reflects these hopes and ideas and um, hypotheses. It also indicates where Swedish settlements were located. It identifies Fort Orange on the uh, banks of the Hudson River. Um, it provides um, information, um, the names of counties in Virginia, which I have listed on the uh, on in this sidebar here. And uh, it shows Carolina, which was the name of the patent issue to Sir Robert Heath in 1629. It's really one of the first maps to show the Carolina Platte to name the Carolina um, patent. And this map was published in several states, I think six states. And uh, the following slides um, provide information um, in regards to each state. The Virginia apparently did not become involved with uh, the map production until the third state and that's when you see her name included in the um, in the imprint for the very first time. And this is the the imprint right here. So and here's um, additional information regarding um, the uh, map of Virginia. It is a nifty map of the colony, published in the 1650s and 1660s. So John Letterer's map a map of the whole territory traversed by John Letterer in History of Arches is specifically of the Virginia Piedmont region. It is not based on the John White map. It is not based on John Smith's map. It is his rendition of his travels through the Piedmont. Uh, it identifies his three marches as he refers to them and each march is numbered. March number one began here. March number two began here, and you'll see the markings for March number three here. There are several rivers identified on this map, and he even shows the location of one Robert Tolliver upon the banks of a river, which we think is the Rappahannock River. He does show the Pamunkey 
and the Mattapanai rivers. It's the first map to really detail the interior of Virginia and North Carolina, and it did help open up trade with the Cherokee and Catawba tribes of North Carolina. It was highly influential. Uh, after this was published in 1672, there were a number of uh, publishers, map makers and publishers who used the information in Letterer's map to um, help design and draw their sections of Virginia and North Carolina. And there's a list of maps here in which you can find the influence of Letterer's map present. And for those of you who are interested in North Carolina, um, his influence can be seen in a new description of Carolina by order of the Lord Proprietors that was published in 1673. Uh, this map is available in several libraries and it is also online as well. And last but not least, the Augustine Hermit map. Um, I want to note that there are several other maps of Virginia published, but due to time, um, I had to narrow it down for this presentation. Um, the, the important maps, the uh, maps that um, exerted a lot of influence. And this one here, Virginia, Maryland, as it is inhabited, this present year 1670, is really and truly the first map of the colony of Virginia and Maryland that did not rely on the Smith, the John Smith map. It did not rely upon John White's map. It is based on Augustine Herman's own work, explorations and surveys. And that's why this map is so important. It replaced the John Smith map of Virginia as the map of the colony. It is oriented north. There are three compass roses present to help you with the map's orientation. Here's the first one, here's the second one, and alas, here is the third one. There are several symbols present. You have the British coat of arms. You have the coat of arms for the Baltimore family. Of course, there is a portrait down here, but from all intents and purposes, this is not the portrait of Augustine Herman. Historian Christian Coote has done some research to indicate that this is a composite portrait, most likely a um, portrait used by um, other artists. So it's a composite. It's really not a portrait of Augustine Herman, which a lot of people have thought. So as you look at it, there is a lot of textual information scattered along the map. And the textual information provides uh, details regarding the flora and fauna of, of the colony, historical information, um, physical details about the colonies of Virginia and Maryland. And what's important to remember is that it is based on the Mercator projection. And this means that he had mariners in mind. Augustine Herman was thinking about traders Mariners, sea captains, he would be sailing the rivers of the tidewater regions of Maryland and Virginia, and he would be sailing up the Chesapeake Bay. He used the Mercator projection because it makes it easy for mariners to plot their courses. And of course, he's um, he includes information regarding the shoals, more information than what's provided on the Dudley chart. So here are uh, representations of shoals. And if you look closely, you can see the soundings are indicated as well. So shoals present here, shoals present here, shoals present here. He provides um, the sounding information here at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. So there is a cartouche. Um, it's it's um, embellished or it's, um, it has along its both sides, um, Native Americans who have very strong European um, features. The reference guide to the map is located here. 
And the cartouche is here. Again, mariners divide dividers uh, identify the location of the cartouche. And as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, bathymetric information with soundings included. So once again, here in the Delaware Bay, you have not only the show sh shoals shown, you also have soundings listed as well. And it's a fantastic example of Dutch map making because of its emphasis on the seacoast. And you will notice that the coastline is darker. The engraving was deeper for this section because they wanted to emphasize the coastline. The map also um, helped benefit the colony of Maryland because Herman used this opportunity to indicate that the 40th parallel was the boundary line between Delaware and Maryland. And it also helped identify the boundary line between Maryland and Pennsylvania in Maryland's favor. Uh, it also indicates the boundary line between Virginia and Maryland on the eastern shore. This very solid, this line here of two trees, tree lines, is indeed the dividing line between Virginia and Maryland. This, this map has been used in court cases <laughs> uh, throughout the centuries. And that should give you an idea of its importance in American um, cartographical history. So only 200 copies were printed. And when um, the first edition sold out, there were no steps taken to print a second edition. And therefore the, it is, a difficult map to find. It's very rare. And when you check WorldCat, there are only five institutions or five copies of the map that are recorded in first search. Two copies are here in the United States. There is a copy at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. The Library of Congress has a copy, and it's their copy that we've been looking at through this entire presentation. And then there are copies at the British Library and at the um, Bibliothèque Nationale de French, de France Library as well. So it's a rare map. It's an important map. Um, its influence um, was broad and long lasting. Uh, here are examples of the Augustine Herman map influence and other maps. This is a map of Virginia published by John Thornton and Robert Green in 1678, five years after the publication of the Herman map. And you can see its influence. You can also see its influence in this Christopher Brown publication of 1685. Brown decided that um, he would benefit from Engraving a map of Virginia that was smaller than the Herman map. The Herman map is in four sheets. It is not a small map. And Brown thought that his um, constituents uh, would benefit from a smaller map and that it would sell. And he was right. Um, it did sell. And his map is indeed based on Augustine Herman's larger map of Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania. Other map makers who relied on it include Herman Mole, that famous cartographer from the late 17th and early 18th century. Uh, Mr. Mole had a unique letterpress design that he used, and his maps of Virginia and Maryland were probably the best known, were best known in the colonies. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you were to speak to an American colonist, which map of the colonies of Virginia would they be familiar with that represented Virginia and Maryland, it would be those published by Herman Bull. We have in the Library of Virginia collections um, several copies of the Herman Bull map, including this German edition that was published in 1719 or 1729. Um, it, they're lovely, lovely maps. So there several of the maps that we've looked at today are online. I have included uh, links to them. And for those of you who are watching this presentation through YouTube, um, of course, the links will not be hot, 
but you can certainly copy them down and then go visit them at your leisure. Also, uh, I've provided a uh, bibliography as well. And the bibliography is about two or three pages in length. For those of you who are interested in getting a PDF copy of this PowerPoint presentation, you can email me and I can send you a copy through email. Uh, my email information is present on the very last page. Um, it's cassandra.farrell at lva.virginia.gov. That is Cassandra dot feral at lva.virginia.gov and I apologize that we were not able to change the color on my email address uh, we tried but um, the program just would not work with us for some reason so I want to thank you for joining us for this presentation of Virginia and the southeast and century century maps and Maryland too with closed captioning um we will keep you informed about upcoming map events um, in 2021 and again um, we apologize in advance for any um, errors in spelling that you may see in the closed captioning um, we uh we try our best and closed captioning is still a work in progress but we um, ask for your grace and mercy um, as you watch this presentation and as you see some misspelled words in the closed captioning. But thank you for joining us. I hope that you have a, a great day and that you have an opportunity to check out the Library of Virginia's website and web pages and check out our events page for additional programming that will be coming up in 2020 and 2021. Thank you and have a great day.